I want to offer something more about the gospel before I preach this morning about Jesus' message. Because you listen to it and study it, he in his day was making some pretty bold requests of those who decided to follow his pathway. I'm not sure he would have made a very good parish priest or United Church minister. He probably would not have been received very well because his words were harsh and they are words that invite us to consider our own values and priorities in life. It's a parable, in fact, about looking forward rather than backward. The disciples have to let go of any vengeance. Everything that shrinks your world, their world, or imprisons them or us in the past and ties us to our habitual reactions, those things must be jettisoned out of the way in order for the values of God and of God's realm to take place. Let us pray. O God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in our sight, you our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. We all know, especially those of us who do ministry for a living on this side of the border, that ministry in the church today is and needs to be quite different. But today, I as one also find it a very exciting and passionate time to be in ministry in the church, despite some sobering realities, like the fact that our numbers are in great and immense decline. Since 1994, somewhere between 800 and 1,000 charges, pastoral charges, have closed. It was just last week that I heard of two others that were merging together in Mississauga. And yes, we might have more franchises than Tim Hortons. I'm not sure if it's just over 3,400 to 2,200 franchises for you trivia fanatics but we're losing ground every single year. And add to these realities that we are under siege by a loud atheism that equates all religion with a form of fundamentalism. There are challenges, yes, but there are also great opportunities. The vocation of the church lay commissioned and ordained remains a high and holy calling to proclaim and to embody and to walk in the ways of the prophet Jesus, the Christ, in our age and in our time. The bonus is that those of us who are still left in congregations are there for the most part because they want to be, not because they should be. There is more of a stigma attached these days in the 21st century to going to church than to not going to church. We are a holy remnant, friends, full of passion and commitment. And in a new and emerging church, to imagine, at least from my limited capacity, a new way of being the institution that we call church. That new perspective is captured by the word emerging. And what I mean by this only partly concerns the new practices that are common to many congregations these days that are thriving and doing very well, like small group ministries, a dynamic hospitality team, faith formation programs that teach people different ways to pray and to meditate. Worship that is filled with great and very different music than back in our earlier days and relevant preaching. Thriving congregations do these things well 
And there are some to be found still in Canada. But more fundamentally, new emerging congregations are the ones that take the evolutionary paradigm very seriously. When the being of God enters the realm of space and of time, the realm of creation, this world that you and I inhabit, it becomes evolutionary in nature. We know that we live in an evolutionary universe. That is a scientific fact. It's how life has developed geologically, biologically, culturally, and spiritually. And in humans, this evolutionary thrust gave rise to the capacity for conscious self-reflection. You see, we are not only aware, we are aware that we are aware. And because of this, we are a part of creation and we are now able to consciously participate in the evolution of the universe. Evolution no longer happens to us. It happens through us. And the future belongs to any of those who get this at the level of their gut and their heart. The Christian faith can still talk about God and Christ, but if it is to be relevant, it needs to do so from within an evolutionary understanding of our universe. So how does evolution work? It works in the beginning by putting together new holes out of disparate parts. Atoms of hydrogen and oxygen come together, and from their meeting, a completely new thing emerges. Something that no one could have predicted from the inherent characteristics of these two completely different atoms. The water molecule comes into being. This is what scientists today have come to call novelty. I recalled this past week as I prepared this sermon a very short film that I watched on TV two years ago called The Visitor. The protagonist in the film is an aging economics professor, Walter, who has been a widow for some years and he is still in grief and basically he is faking being alive. His uniform is a suit and a tie, and Walter follows the same daily ritual day in and day out. He hasn't written anything original forever, and he's lost his interest in the field many years ago. He's putting in time while his pension kicks in. Walter, you see, died a long time ago. He just forgot to stop breathing. He's now required by his department head to travel off to New York to give a lecture that he plagiarized and doesn't care about. He walks into his pied-à-terre in Manhattan and is attacked by a man who has been there squatting. In his apartment with his girlfriend, they were an undocumented couple. The two men wrestle until Walter is able to convince the intruder that his apartment, this is his apartment, and it belongs to him. The couple then leaves for fear that they will be reported to the immigration services. But Walter then surprises himself by going after the man and inviting him to stay the night. Suddenly, he strikes up a relationship with the young man, Tarek, who is a Syrian. Tarek, you see, plays the jambi. And Walter suddenly becomes fascinated by this instrument. Tarek teaches him then to play. Walter then removes his tie every once in a while as his awkward hands learn to tap out the beat. When nobody is around, Walter even plays in his underwear. How delightful. Walter slowly, painfully starts to come back to life as the two men become the most unlikely of friends. Then one day, the authorities arrest Tarek. 
and Walter is his only hope. By day, Walter becomes Tarek's visitor and sole advocate. By night, Walter is a jumbie freak, playing in drum circles in Central Park and listening to world music on his stereo. It's a beautiful thing, you see, to witness the resurrection of Walter. After I watched that short film, I swear my life to you that the words that came out of my mouth were, Walter is the church. Walter is that part of the institution that is just going through the motions. Some of us are still in grief for what life in the church used to be like back in the 50s. You know, I was one of them, one of those kids where there were 500 kids in Sunday school, two services that were filled with overflowing, and back then and in the 60s we had the ear of the politicians because of our sheer numbers. And sometimes I wonder if we, like Walter, aren't just faking it and doing a good job of it. Our sanctuaries and worship services acted as our own pied, private pied de buffer zones against any threat of change. These intruders were not people. In the film. They were worldviews that challenged our status quo even in our congregations that have come in in fundamental ways, just as Walter's status quo was challenged. What I'm talking about here is modernism and postmodernism. There's a parable, I think, that helps distinguish between traditionalism, modernism, and postmodernism. Imagine that life is like a baseball game and there are three different umpires assigned to call the balls and the strikes. The traditionalist umpire simply says, I call them as they are. He knows he is in possession of some infallible judgment and truth. Now the modernist umpire says, I call them as I see them. And how he sees them is likely to be aided by technology like the Hawkeye that you see in tennis matches. This is objective, measurable, scientific truth. The postmodernist umpire says, they ain't nothing till I call them. Here you see everything is in context and perspective. There is no truth. Only interpretations that are shaped by cultural contexts and perspectives. Walter transcends and yet includes hydrogen and oxygen. And through this process, something new is born in Walter. The emerging church is a community of people who situate themselves in the very center of that divine creativity, continuously, daily, hourly, discerning and then cooperating with who? The Spirit, to bring forth some new thing that wants to be born through you. We are all hydrogen and oxygen molecules, just a little more complex. We come together, and who knows what new thing the Spirit will shape out of our life together. We only know this. It will be totally, wildly, magnificently unpredictable. And if the 14 billion year old universe is any guide for us, the more we open to this sacred evolutionary power, the more beauty, the more goodness and truth you and I can manifest together. 
This scripture reading this morning, I will confess to you, is one of my favorite teachings of Jesus. It has informed my life in ministry within this model. Anyone who puts their hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. You see, I believe religious institutions, including the church, sometimes act as though they exist to perpetuate a particular form across generations and centuries. This is, I think and believe, cosmologically speaking, weird behavior. A new and emerging congregation knows that because God, you see, is always doing a new thing in an evolutionary universe. There is no point in getting attached to particular forms, you know, ways of worshiping, ways of saying the Lord's Prayer, buildings, pews, committee structures. The only question that really matters is whether these are serving the creative intentions, not of us, but of the Holy One. If they aren't, then we move on. Traditionalism, you see, is like putting our hand to the plow and looking back and getting stuck in the past. The universe never recreates the wheel. It carries the form of the wheel forward as long as it's serving its creative intentions. It does this at a biological level, through DNA, at a cultural level, through our value systems, and at a spiritual level, through wisdom teachings and practices that stand the test of time. But we, or but when, the church moves into what I call form fetish, it's dead. We might look back longingly at outdated forms and structures, but when we do, the spirit just keeps moving on and leaves us behind. This is what I believe is happening to mainline congregations. We move ahead in our thinking and in our theology. We're open to being inclusive and liberal and all of that stuff for sure. But we've got ourselves stuck in old forms and old structures and we're still hanging on to them for life. Some of us would rather die than let go of them and it's killing congregations. In one of the resurrection stories, the resurrected Christ tells the disciples that he is going on ahead of them to Galilee and that he will meet them there. I think this is an apt metaphor for an emerging congregation. Christ is always going on ahead of us. And just when we think we've nailed him down where we want him, he's up and calling us from a future that is in need of us to be born. Congregations that continuously look back to first century to find Christ, folks, you're looking in the wrong place. Always, always, always. He's gone ahead of us. He's calling us from the future. The emerging congregations understand that truth itself evolves. There is an absolute truth, yes. But as soon as this absolute enters into time and space, it becomes a developing, evolving reality. So here we are in the 19th year of the 21st century as two churches. We have no authority as an institution. 
We have no right to make claims about truth. We recognize that it's possible to be good without God. Our story is just one, one possible narrative among many others that are in this world. And we have a bias against the kind of leadership, lay, and clergy that could lead us out of the wilderness. Remember Walter? The economics professor who was basically faking being alive? I said he was the church. I also believe wholeheartedly that the church has the potential to be raised from the dead like Walter, or I would not be standing here today. In the film, The Visitor, it closes with a scene in which a tireless Walter is bouncing up and down in the New York subway station with his jumbie slung over his shoulder. He finds himself a bench and he sets up his instrument and he starts to play. He settles into a rhythm that transports him to reverie. He's in the flow. He's got the beat. The trains come and they go and some passerbys, they disapprove of Walter. There's others who smile and begin to move. Some think it's curious that such an old man should carry on in such a very public way. But Walter, he couldn't care less what anybody thinks about and what they think about him. Because he's seen and experienced a new heaven and a new earth. And there's no looking back. Walter found the beat. Can you feel it? Can we step into the rhythm of this God-infused universe and bring forth the new world that needs us in order to be born? I hope so. May it be so for you. May it be so for me.